Welcome to Maple Avenue Christian Church, a great place to connect, grow, serve, and share. We hope that through today's service, you'll connect with God and build community with Christ's followers. Please use the online form to let us know how we can pray for you this week. If you're worshiping in person, you can fill out a connection card located at the back. To help us stay better connected, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook. Don't forget to turn on the notifications so that you don't miss a thing. To be added to our email updates, or if you're having trouble receiving emails, please contact the church office. Before we get started, please take a moment to silence your phone. Here's what's going on at MACC. Sermon questions for small groups or a personal reflection are now available on our website or at the back of the worship center. Four Seasons Senior Fellowship invites anyone who considers themselves a senior to a luncheon Thursday, December 9th at noon. We'll be treated to a performance by the Macomb High School Madrigals right here at MACC. Giving envelopes for 2022 are available at the back of the worship center by the sound booth. St. George's Clothing Closet will be accepting gently used clothing donations for adults and children through December 19th. You can drop off items in the bins in the atrium. Watch for details coming soon to find out how you can help serve or deliver our 2021 Christmas Eve dinners. Our Christmas Eve service will be December 24th at 6.30. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Be sure to check us out online to stay updated throughout the week. But for now, you can't say we didn't tell you. Every year we light candles on the Advent wreath as we prepare for the coming of Christ. More and more candles and more and more light as we watch and wait for Jesus, the light of the world. Please stand as we pray for the hope and peace together. God of promise, come into our darkness. Renew your hope and peace in us. To you alone bring life out of death. Receive God's promise of peace from Psalms 4. Know that the Lord has set us apart for God for himself. The Lord will help when we call to him. Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. We will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make us dwell in safety. In Christ's name, amen. star burns in the darkness, shines with the promise, Emmanuel. One child born in the stillness, living within us, Emmanuel. We're singing singing glory, glory. 
Isaiah prophesied, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Welcome to Maple Avenue. We're glad that you're here to worship with us uh, this morning, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, you have had a great uh, time fellowshipping with each other. Um, and whether you're worshiping with us in person or online, we're glad that you're here um, to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with us. And whether you're a first-time visitor, maybe you've been coming your entire life, we're glad you're here, and we really pray that you'll encounter the Holy Spirit in a very real way today and that your life will be changed, and that you will be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Just a, a couple of things real quick I want to touch on uh, as we continue in our worship, but uh, one thing I failed to have mentioned and put in the announcement video this morning was that uh, next week uh, we will be doing a youth group trip down to Quincy. We're going to meet here at 3, and we're going to leave here at 3, so you can get here a little before 3. So if you're Sixth grade to a senior in high school, this is for you. We're going to do a trip to Quincy, a shopping trip, so you guys can get out of town and, and get stuff for your parents or loved ones or yourself or whatever. Uh, but we're going to do that. We'll shop. We'll 
have dinner together and we should return here to Maple Avenue between 7.30 and 8. So just put that down as a reminder uh, and invite your friends and have uh, people come. We'll just have a good time. And then <clears throat> something else I just want to bring out again, it's in the bulletin, but January 2nd, we will, beginning, we will be beginning education hour again. We're at a place where we can do that. So we'll, we'll, education will start at 9 a.m. So this time, instead of coming to worship, we'll do education at 9 a.m. Then we'll do fellowship in our fellowship hall in the atrium out there from 10 to 10.30. And then starting at 10.30, we'll come in and we'll, have, we'll start our worship service. So keep that in mind. That's January 2nd. You heard it here. You read it here. Now be here and let's do that, okay? So anyway, this morning we are, uh, oh, also there are offering envelopes in the back in front of the sound booth. You can grab those on your way out. Uh, this morning we are beginning a brand new sermon series entitled Miraculous Births. And I, I also want to thank everybody, man, just for wearing red today. It's kind of fun. Uh, next week, if you didn't get the memo, next week is green. It's Grinch. So we're going to be celebrating that. And I have heard everything in the world this morning. I've heard that I look like an inmate um, I, I've heard that I, I look like uh, Waldo. Where's Waldo? Uh, the best, I think, was I look like Thing One. <laughs> John Gage. Um, jolly Old Elf. I, I, thank you. I, I know what you're saying. I, I'm trying, okay? But uh, anyway, so it's just fun. And so thank you guys for pitching in and having fun with us. Next week, let's continue. It, it'll be green. Oh, here's Jason did this one for me. So, anyway, anyway, just having fun, and you can have fun at church. You can laugh at church, for all those of you who didn't know that. So, uh, but this morning, we are beginning a new series. It's called Miraculous Births, and uh, I know that as December begins and Christmas season begins, everybody's thinking of usually just one miraculous birth, and that miraculous birth is the birth of Jesus Christ. And to be sure, we will talk about the birth of Christ on December 19th, the Sunday before Christmas. But in this series, we're also going to look at the miraculous births of Samuel uh, in the Old Testament. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 1 today. We're also going to look at John the Baptist. We're going to look at the birth of Jesus. And then we're going to wrap things up on December 26th by looking at the miraculous birth of the church. And then in January, we're going to start in with a, a series called Foundation. Okay, we're going to talk about our foundation in faith and why the church is important and why our relationship with God is important. So we're going to spend some time doing that. And so what I hope to learn uh, in this series is that a miraculous birth leads to a miraculous life. A miraculous life is a life living out God's purpose. That's what a miraculous life is. You may have your own purpose for life, but a miraculous life is living out God's purpose for your life. So during this series, you're going to be challenged to develop and live out a miraculous life according to God's purpose. You'll be challenged to either begin or to grow in serving God by serving others. That's one of our core values here at Maple Avenue. It's something that we truly believe in, but we serve God by serving others. You're also going to be challenged in sharing God with others. You're going to be challenged to carry your cross daily. You're going to be challenged to carry the name of Jesus everywhere you go. So those are the things that we're going to do through this, this series. And my goal in this series is to see real life change happen in your life. That's what we want to see is real life change. Today specifically, I want to see people either commit or grow in their service for the kingdom of God. So that's what we're going to look at. So as we look at these miraculous births that lead to a miraculous life, I want you all to understand that if you haven't, you too, every person in this room, if you haven't yet, you too can experience a miraculous birth. Jesus called it being born again. And that's the miraculous birth that each and every one of us can experience for our lives. And as that happens, then you can really experience a miraculous life, living out God's purpose. A miraculous birth leads to a miraculous life. Let me pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you for this time to come together to worship you today as a body of believers. And thank you that we uh, can come and just praise you. We can sing songs to you. We can pray to you. We can read your word. We can understand it in a way that changes our lives. We can fellowship with each other. We can have fun with each other. And so we thank you for that. Um, so be with us. Watch over us. Bless our time together. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Folks, have you ever thought about your purpose in life? 
Have you ever found yourself asking questions like, God, if you believe in God, if you actually talk to God, a lot of people say they believe in God, but they don't live their life like they really believe in God. They don't go to him. They don't talk to him. So, but if you believe in God, do you ever find yourself asking questions like, God, why am I here? Why in the world did you create me, however many years ago it was, 18, 16, 12, 52, 78, however many years ago, why did you create me? Why? What's the whole meaning of this? What's my purpose on this earth? Do I even have a purpose? Well, just to answer that one real quick, yes, you do. Every person ever created has purpose. You were created with a purpose. Maybe some of you this morning, maybe you've had hard times in your life, or or maybe even right now you're going through a really hard time and you just feel like there's no purpose in life. We just heard about the school shooting up in Michigan. That young man didn't feel like there was purpose in life. So I know it happens. I know there are people who just go through life and they don't feel like they have any purpose at all. And that's a tough place to be. And in our passage today, we're going to be introduced to a a woman who feels purposeless. She feels like she has no purpose at all. This woman's name is Hannah, and she's the mother of Samuel, the one who was born a miraculous birth, the one who lived a miraculous life of carrying out his ministry. So this morning, if you would, open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1 so you can follow along. But we're going to have a video. It's going to read this, share this with us, but follow along as it reads this. 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord, and she made a vow, saying, Oh, Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord. Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. 
When the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband, told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Okay, so let's look at this miraculous birth of Samuel. Like most families throughout history, there are some issues. I, I would venture to say that most of us have families and there are some issues and there are definitely issues in this family right away we're introduced to hannah's husband elkanah elkanah's name means god has created or god has taken possession god has created or god has taken possession we're told that he is also an ephraimite we also discover that he is a man with two wives and as is the case with most polygamous marriages there was a rivalry between the two women Penina taught, uh, taunted Hannah uh, about her being childless. I mean, she was relentless with that. Elkanah, in his, his own way, tried to bring comfort to his wife, but I personally believe he failed miserably. Did you catch what he said in verse 8? Did you see it? Look at verse 8 again in chapter 1 of 1 Samuel. He said, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? I don't know about y'all, but it seems that he was pretty confident in his ability to meet his wife's needs. You know, and, and some may call it arrogance. I don't know, maybe. I, I don't know, but that just seems a little bit uh, assertive, if, if you ask me. We don't know a lot more about Elkanah. Uh, we just don't. But one thing that stands out to me is the fact that he allowed his baby boy to leave home and to live at the house of the Lord. Now, remember, Hannah's the one who made this deal, if you will, with God, not Elkanah. He, he didn't make this deal, but he trusted. And to me, he demonstrated a deep trust in God, and he demonstrated a deep trust in his wife, because this is a son. Now, in this culture, I'm not saying this is the way it is, but in this culture, when you have a son, he has a special place in the family. So Elkanah is saying to Hannah, hey, I trust you in this. This is huge. And this is a big trust in God, too. So Elkanah's devotion may have had an impact on Samuel's own attitude toward his own calling. Now, we can only imagine that Elkanah uh, must have been so proud of his firstborn son from Hannah as he watched Samuel grow and, and have a miraculous life of carrying out his ministry of becoming one of Israel's first major prophets. It was Samuel who crowned Saul, the king of Israel, and later anointed a shepherd boy by the name of David to become Israel's greatest king. Elkanah was the father of Samuel, and he loved him, and he trusted God, and he trusted his wife, and he allowed his son to be delivered over to ministry for God for his entire life. Next in the story, we have Hannah, and her name means grace. And boy, oh boy, do we see grace in the way she lived her life. Hannah was Elkanah's first wife, and he loved her deeply. Hannah was unable to have children, as we saw in the story. And in her culture, this made her an undesirable woman, according to culture, because she couldn't have children. And so she felt as though her purpose wasn't being fulfilled. She felt purposeless. and She had no purpose. According to the view of her day, the woman uh, had the role of giving birth to the fruit of the male seed. That was her role. That was her purpose. That was her responsibility. And so in her culture, she felt like she had no purpose. One Jewish law even states that a man must 
listen, a man must divorce his wife if they are childless after 10 years of normal marital relations. No pressure, right? None. And now, scientifically, we know it's not even the woman's responsibility most of the time. It's a lot of it on the male. But, so what we also have to understand is that a single woman, she's going to struggle in this day and age. So she was desperate. But notice what happened. We read, we read it, but look at it, at it again in verses 19 through 20. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and then they went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. God remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant, gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So the story of Hannah, it can teach us a lot of lessons for our lives today. I want to just share with you four lessons, just real, real quick. Um, first, Hannah turned to God in prayer during her time of need. Listen, folks, you don't have to wait till you're in a time of need. Turn to God in prayer. Seek God daily in your prayer life. Seek him multiple times a day. God desires for you, his child, to call out his name, to be in a relationship with him. You're not going to ask him anything that's too big for him to accomplish. You're not going to say something to him that's going to offend him. He already knows what's going on in your mind. He already knows how, what kind of life you're living. So just ask him. He desires to hear from you. If you're a parent, you know how badly you desire to hear from your children. We want to hear from them. We long to hear from them. God wants to hear from you. He desires that more than you could ever want to hear from your child. God wants us in that kind of relationship. So pray to him, and you don't have to wait till you're in a time of need. But when you're in a time of need, you can always turn to him. Second, Hannah praised and thanked God when he did answer her prayers. How many times have you prayed to God and he's answered that prayer in some way or another, and then you just fail to say thank you? How many times in life, do people meet a need of yours, or they, they meet some, a need that you've asked them to meet, and then we just simply just forget to say thanks. Just be kind. Be kind to God. I mean, seriously, just say thank you. Just praise him and thank him. Give him the praise. Third, she kept her commitment to the Lord, even though it must have been, listen, it must have been harder than not having a child. To give that child up, boy, that's huge. And she did. She gave him up willingly god didn't make her give him up but she did she gave him up for his service to the lord that's what he had asked or that's what she had told him she would do and then she fell uh, followed through with her commitment fourth god blessed hannah beyond what she had asked hannah asked for a child right if you go on and read about hannah and you read all of first samuel in the end hannah was not only the mother of samuel but of three other sons and two daughters God blessed her beyond what she had asked. The story of Hannah has often been a great inspiration to women who are struggling with fertility or women who are struggling to have children for whatever reason. But the reality is, listen, this doesn't happen to every family who struggles with infertility. And I'm not up here trying to say it does. And I'm not saying it's a, it's a faith issue. I don't believe that for a second. No. Sometimes... Women just can't have children. Sometimes men cannot produce seed to have children. I mean, it just happens. That's life. That's not God punishing you. Please hear that. But this has been an inspiration. Though God doesn't always answer in the same way, Hannah's attitude, that's what we pick up. Hannah's attitude of prayer. Hannah's attitude of dependence on the Lord that's the example we need to turn to because there's probably something you're struggling with. Maybe it's not infertility, but maybe there's something else going on in your life that you're struggling with. The attitude of prayer, the attitude of dependence upon God, that's what we learn from her life. Let that be a life lesson for each and every one of us, no matter what's going on. We have an attitude of prayer and an attitude of dependence upon God. Not only was Hannah unable to have children, but her husband, Elkanah, uh, decided he would marry someone else who could have children. So he married Penina. Intro Penina. Penina was quite the woman, to say the least. 
Penina's name means jewel. That's what her name means. But she must have been a diamond in the rough, if you ask me, because she was no jewel at all to Hannah. She was rude and mean. Her constant jabs at Hannah became intensified because Elkanah's love and tenderness toward Hannah, whose heart uh, often ached because she couldn't have children. And she was aching because she, Penina was jealous of, of Hannah. And so Penina would taunt Hannah. Can you imagine going to worship God? And somebody has made it their sworn duty to provoke you, to get under your skin, to, to just provoke you and ride you. And some of you are going, yes, I can. I absolutely know what that feels like. And listen, I'm sorry if you've ever felt that way. I know what it feels like. I do, and I know it's horrible. If you're a diamond in the rough, if you're that person over there taunting somebody, if you have made it your sworn duty to just be rude to people, to provoke people, then knock it off. There's no room for that in, in the Lord's family. So if you have this attitude of being divisive, if you have an attitude of provoking others, if you think, oh, I'll be the devil's advocate because that's, no, there's no place for that in the family of God. And there's no place for that in this house of worship. So if that's your sworn duty, or if that's your attitude, if that's your bent, then take it somewhere else. Or change and repent, because that is not what we need. That is not what God desires. I've actually had somebody tell me before, in church, well, you need to have a devil's advocate on the leadership. No, we don't. You're an advocate of Satan? No. Not at all. We pray for peace. We pray for unity. We pray for like-mindedness. Not robots. Not yes men, but we pray for those things. We talk to You don't need a devil's advocate. Not in leadership, not in the church. That's crazy. That wasn't planned, but anyway, uh, that was free today. <laughs> next, um, we have Eli. Eli the priest, he's the next one in this, this story of this miraculous birth. Eli means ascension. That's what Eli means. Eli was a Jewish priest who lived in the day of the judges. Now, we did a series a few years ago on the book of Judges, and, and as we know, uh, Judges, they served God. Eli, he served God at the tabernacle in Shiloh. Now, some of you may be wondering what a tabernacle was or is. Uh, a tabernacle uh, was the tabernacle of Moses. It was a temporary place of worship. It was like a huge tent and, and that the Israelites built according to God's specifications while they were wandering in the desert. And they used it until King Solomon uh, built the temple, and it's viewed as the actual dwelling place of God. So that's why they're still in the tabernacle, because Solomon hasn't come along yet. Remember, Solomon is the son of David, and Samuel is the one who anoints David when he's a boy. So we've got a ways until we get to Solomon. But anyway, Eli had two really wicked sons, and their names were Hophni and Phinehas, okay? Uh, they also served in the tabernacle, as their dad did, but they didn't know the Lord. Listen, you can serve in the church, you can be in full-time ministry, you can proclaim the name of Jesus, you can be an elder, you can be a, 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 a ministry team leader, you can, you can be a, a, a preacher and not know the Lord. It happens. It absolutely happens. And Eli, his sons, they didn't know the Lord, even though they served in the church. They violated the law by keeping and eating meat from the sacrifices that were not allocated to them. They also had sex with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meetings. The bad behavior of Eli's sons was apparently widely known all throughout. People knew. You know, it's just like here in town. If, if your kids are acting up, you're going to hear about it one way or another, right? Well, this happened with Eli. And the report came back to Eli. And so when Eli found out about these things... Uh, he, he rebuked his sons, but he failed to make them stop. But he allowed them to keep serving. He allowed them to keep performing, uh, in the, in, or performing their duties in the tabernacle, which just profaned the tabernacle. Eventually, God sent a prophet to Eli to deliver a dire message to him. 
And this is the message. You can read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'll, I'll share a little bit with it. He said, I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. What happens to your two sons will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. That's 1 Samuel 2, 31 and 1 Samuel 2, 34. This was a terrible curse because the Levites, they depended on the priesthood for their living. Eli's family line would be replaced by another more faithful priest. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35 says this, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. The priest God would, uh, raised up was a boy named Samuel. And his name, Samuel's name, means either name of God or God has heard. Those are the two possibilities of what the name of Samuel means. So now that Samuel has been born, let's transition, okay, and let's look at the miraculous life of Samuel. What is it so amazing about his life as he carried out his ministry? Well, the young Samuel lived in the tabernacle under the tutelage and the care of Eli, the priest, right? So he was probably around four years old when his mother Hannah weaned him and brought him to the tabernacle to live for the rest of his life. Even as a child, even when Samuel was a child, Hannah would make a tunic for Samuel every year. She would bring it to him when she and Elkanah would come to Shiloh and worship the Lord. Now, what we have to understand is that a tunic was a garment reserved for a priest as he ministered before the Lord in the tent of meetings. That's what a tunic is. That's why that's important. That's a little thing. In our passage when it said, and no razor shall ever touch his head, that was a Nazarite vow, that they would never shave their head. Those are things that we pick up on. He was being set aside as a priest. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit, but he wasn't from the line of Levi. We'll talk about that. But traditionally, the sons of the priest would succeed their father in ministry. However, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, like we said, they were wicked and, 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 and that they were, you know, immoral and, and it showed contempt for the Lord's offering. So they weren't, God didn't want them following. Meanwhile, Samuel, he continued to grow in, in stature and in favor with God and with men. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like Luke 2.52, doesn't it? We're talking about Jesus and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. The only way a life can truly be a miraculous life is if it continues to grow in the Lord, okay? So for people, maybe this identifies you, but if you think that, oh, I I'll accept Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and then after that, I'm done. I like the way Jason tells the kids, because I think, as, you know, as adults, we need to remember this too. Your, your, your salvation in Jesus, when, you, when you're baptized in Christ, that's not the finish line. That's the starting line. That's the starting line. And then you have to grow in wisdom and favor with God, continually growing. If you're not further along in your relationship with God today than you were last year at this time, then, then spend some time with God and ask Him why. If it feels like the same old thing, day in, day out, then ask Him why. There should be a real joy a real honor. I read something the other day, and I don't remember where I read it, who I read it from, but I loved it. And, and the person wrote this. They said, a lot of people approach life as though church is a part of your life. Church is just a part of your life. Your relationship with Jesus is just a part of your life. That's not true. You belong to God, and life is just a part of your relationship with God. That's the way we need to look at it. Does that make sense? You get what I'm saying? You belong to God. Once you accept him as Lord and Savior, once you say, okay, you're my Savior, I surrender to you, you're my Lord. When you say you're my Lord, that means he's the boss of your life. He's your life. And then all the other stuff you do, your job, it's just a part of it. Your family, it's just a part of it. Your friends are just a part of it. These careers that we we give up time with family and church for, that's just a part of our life. Our life is all based on Him. 
So we have to continue to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. So let's talk about real quick how Samuel carried out his ministry as prophet. Okay, first of all, he carried it out as prophet. That's how he carried out his ministry. He was a prophet at a time when prophecies and visions were becoming more and more rare. Samuel heard what he first believed to be Eli. Remember, okay, and calling him, Eli was calling him, he thought Eli was calling him during the night. Though the young Samuel was ministering in the tabernacle, Samuel did not know, it's 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse Samuel, or, or verse 7, Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not been, yet been revealed to him. The first three times the Lord called Samuel, the boy responded to Eli. And then Eli, he understood what was going on and what was happening, so he instructed Samuel, he said, hey, don't respond to me. He said, when you hear that again, respond to the Lord if he calls again. Then, in 1 Samuel 3.10, the Lord came and stood there calling at, as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And God gave him a message. And he, his first message is a message of judgment. And his first message is a, not only a message of judgment, but it's a message of judgment to the guy who's raising him, to Eli. And so this is, he said, the following day, Samuel took his first leap of faith. And he told Eli everything, even though the message was bad news for Eli and his family. And Eli responded with acceptance. Samuel's credibility as a prophet spread throughout all of Israel, and God continued to reveal his word to his people through Samuel. Here's the prophecy. First, or, or, no, here's how it spread. 1 Samuel 3, 20 through 21. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. That's a miraculous life. Samuel was a faithful prophet. He would take the hardest messages, and he would share them with the people who were closest to him. That's a miraculous life. Confronting people in their sin, confronting people with what God, gently, lovingly, but, but sharing with them the truth of God, that's what we need. Next, Samuel carried out his ministry as a judge. He was a judge. Remember the Philistines? They were enemies of Israel. And they attacked God's people over and over again. Eli's sons were killed in the battle. And the Ark of the Covenant was captured, and it was taken to Philistia. Upon hearing this news of his son's death, as prophesied earlier, Eli, he died. He died of heartbreak he died when he heard this news it just destroyed him and he died after several months the philistines returned the ark of, of israel where it uh, remained at uh, kirith jerem for the next 20 years as israelites cried out to god they asked him for help against the philistine and their oppressors samuel instructed them to get rid of all the false gods that they had allowed into Israel, okay? So what he's doing is he's purifying the land. He's saying, we've got to get rid of all this junk. So he said, get rid of all the false gods that they've been worshiping all this time. And with Samuel's leadership, and by God's power, don't miss that, it's not just Samuel's leadership, but it's also God's power, the Philistines were overcome, and there was a time of peace between the Israelites and the Philistines. Listen to 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 9 through 13 at this miraculous life. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And he cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf. And the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. Samuel was recognized as the judge of all of Israel. That's a miraculous life. He was faithful to what God was calling him to. Samuel, he also carried out his ministry as priest. He was also a priest. In addition to serving as Israel's prophet, Samuel also carried out priestly responsibilities. 
Now, like I said, he was not from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. But God called him to be a priest. See, we have these orders, these rules, these laws, and yes, those were given by God, and I understand that, but God can, can do what God wants to do. He can call you to do what he wants you to do. And this is what Samuel was called to do. He was called to be a priest even though he was from the tribe of Ephraim. First, he was brought up in the temple by Eli. And so he lived his life as in priestly service together with the sons of Eli. So he lived out as a priest. Second, he performed some of the duties that were traditionally assumed to be for the priest. For example, appointing leaders. Appointing leaders and offering sacrifices. Those are priestly duties. The priest is the one who appointed leaders and offered sacrifices. In number 27, it's Eleazar, the high priest, who commissioned Joshua. That was just the way it went. The priest commissioned the leaders. However, it was Samuel, remember, it was Samuel who anointed both Saul and David to be the kings of Israel. In regards to offerings, in 1 Samuel 13, we see Saul waiting for Samuel to arrive so that they can offer the burnt offering and the peace offering. According to Leviticus 1, priest and the offerer, the one who was making the offering, were the only ones involved in making the sacrifice. So Samuel was recognized as a priest and he carried out priestly duties. That's a miraculous life. This is a guy who, whose birth story is miraculous in and of itself. He's delivered to the tabernacle. He's raised by Eli. He's influenced, or he's rubbing shoulders with uh, two young men who are not good influences on him. But he resists that, and he stands, and he's now a priest in the, in, in, in the, in the country of Israel, among the people. That's a miraculous life. And then finally, Samuel carried out his ministry as a faithful servant. He was a faithful servant to all that God had called him to do. Like Eli's sons, Samuel's two sons, Joel and Abiah, sinned before God by seeking dishonest gain and perverting justice. Okay? Samuel had appointed his sons as judges. All right? Samuel was a judge. He appointed his sons to be judge. But the elders of Israel told Samuel that because uh, he was too old and his sons didn't walk in, in the ways of God as he had, they wanted Samuel to appoint a king to rule like other nations had. Samuel's initial reaction to their demand was one of great displeasure, and he prayed to God about the matter. And so Samuel, he felt completely rejected. Could you imagine that? I mean, here you are, you've served your people faithfully. There has been a time of peace between you and your arch rival, the Philistines. You have made sacrifices. You have, you have repented on behalf of your nation before God Almighty. And now you're being rejected. Anybody relate to that? Have you ever felt rejected in your service to others? You serve others. It's what we do. You meet them late at night. You talk about issues that they're struggling with. You confront them about sin in their life, in love, in kindness. You comfort them during a time of loss in their, with their family. You celebrate the birth of a child with them. Most of the time when we serve others, it isn't convenient. And when they're ministered to, uh, the way you minister to them, and then they walk away, you feel rejected. They leave you. They say they're no longer in need of your service. And so they reject you. And that hurts. God told Samuel that they had not rejected him. But they had rejected God as their king. We have to remember, God did not want a king for his people. But his people were disobedient. And Samuel tried to instruct them. No, you don't need a king. And that's why he felt rejected. You need a judge. You need a priest. Could you imagine what the course of history might look like if the people had obeyed God from that point on? If they had said, okay, God, we're not going to do a king. We're not going to try and look like everybody else. We're going to be a people who 
worship you, who follow you, might look a lot different. The life of Samuel, it was miraculous in Israel's history. He was a prophet. He anointed the first two kings of Israel. He was the last in the line of Israel's judges, considered by many as the greatest judge who ever led Israel. And he was a priest. But most of all, he was faithful in his servant to, as a servant to God and to others. The miraculous birth of Samuel that began through the earnest prayers of his mother Hannah led to a miraculous life that carried out his ministry. Samuel is cited alongside Moses and Aaron as men who called on God and were answered. In Psalm 99, verse 6, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord and he answered them. There's much to learn from the life of Samuel. In particular, we see the sovereignty of God in Israel. No matter who the people chose to reign over them, God is sovereign. We may allow other things or people to occupy the, the throne of our hearts, but God will always remain sovereign. He is completely powerful. He is at all, all knowledge, and he is ever-present with all of us. A key verse in the life of Samuel relates to his words to King Saul. And they're found in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And I would encourage you to spend some time this week just meditating on these words. Let these, let these words be a part of your devotion this week with God. 1 Samuel 15, 22. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey, listen, to obey <clears throat> is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Obedience is what God desires, and it takes obedience to be a faithful servant. This answers the question that we asked earlier. What's my purpose in life? When God created you in your mother's womb, in the secret place, when he knitted you together, when he put together the strands of DNA and RNA and, and muscle and fiber and sinew and hair and nails, when he did all that, he had a purpose. And that purpose is for you to obey his will for your life. The world distracts us. The world tries to tell us our purpose is to, to have wealth, to have power, to have prestige. That's what the world tells us. And a lot of us buy into that. But our true purpose is to, to obey the will of God for our lives. The true purpose is to obey the will of God for our lives. Samuel lived a miraculous life. And once you experience that miraculous rebirth that Jesus called being born again, you too will be able to experience a miraculous life of obedience to God the Father. Would you stand and pray with me this morning?
where sin runs deep, your grace is more. What grace is found is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me, and where you are. This morning, uh, for our time of communion, where we come together around the Lord's table, I want to share a passage of Scripture with you that um, it doesn't necessarily talk directly about the Lord's Supper, but this happened during the Lord's Supper. This is just after Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And after he washed their feet, he was, he was talking to them about how they were to live as brothers and sisters in Christ. And in chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another by this. Listen, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There's probably nothing we do that reminds us of the great love Jesus has for us any more than when we eat the bread and drink the juice. It reminds us of his great sacrifice for each and every one of us. His love for us that caused him to go to a cross to lay down his life so that we could have life eternal through him. And so this morning, as we eat the bread, As we drink the juice, let's remember the great love Jesus has for us. And in return, the command he gives us is to love each other. So as you eat this and drink this, you're not doing it by yourself. You're doing it with the people who love you and with people you love. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you for this time this time that we can eat and drink, that we can remember your great love for us. Help us, Father, to live our lives with a great love like that toward one another. We pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.
Now we come to a time in our service where we give our tithes and offerings, and so we want to pray for those and ask God's blessing on them. So join me as we pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you for this time where we can give back. Um, Help us to do so with a cheerful and joyful attitude. Thank you for the way that you've blessed us and strengthened us and uh, given to us. And uh, God, I pray that uh, our uh, tithes and offerings today would be a blessing to you. Uh, We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Will you please stand? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God started a work in you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he has begun a good work in you and he will be faithful to complete it. But like Donnie says, God also needs our obedience. So I just want to challenge you to live out God's purpose for your life this week. 
If you're new here with us this morning, Donnie is back in the hospitality room, just right through those doors. He'd love to meet you and get to know you a little bit. And if you need giving envelopes for next year, the giving envelopes are right in front of the sound booth, and you can pick those up on your way out. Everyone have a great week. Thank you.